on February 3rd, 1970, the Dean of Asbury College, Custer B. Williams, was scheduled to speak in chapel. But he, he uh, sensed that he shouldn't, shouldn't share the message and that he should allow for students to share any testimonies that they might have. And, and uh, that gave way to dozens and dozens of students sharing and confessing their sins openly and flooding to the altar to seek the Lord for his forgiveness and help to live for him. And there had been this expectant uh, attitude, uh, mood about, about what God was doing in those days, and, and, and it happened. A powerful revival came to that campus, and not just to that chapel, though. It, it did happen for that school. There was, there was classes canceled for a whole week. Maybe the students would enjoy that. But it wasn't just to have school off. It was so that they could be in the chapel together as much as possible because God was very real there in that place and so for 144 hours there was an unbroken time where people just came to the Hughes Auditorium their chapel for prayer and for testimony led by some faculty members but there was no really any preaching involved it was just the testimony of the students and over 2,000 witness teams went to other states and countries, even Canada, uh, and, and to uh, at least 130 college campuses around the nation, including some Nazarene colleges and churches. One of those students was Joe McClumber, who traveled with one of the witness teams. He says, I was a senior at Asbury Seminary preparing for pastoral ministry when the revival came. And he had gone to Greenfield College. And so he decided that he and some of the other students that had gone there would drive all night to that college in Illinois and be there as part of that chapel service. And he said, we drove all night and a few of us shared and had went and, and what we had witnessed there at Wilmore, Kentucky, where Asbury is, and students spontaneously began streaming to the altar. Bruce Roy, uh, also a student there in 1970, said he was very involved in the outreaches that spawned from the revival. And he said, I traveled to many churches, colleges, countries, telling of God's visitation to the campus with always the same resulting outpouring of God's presence and power. This is part of what happens uh, as part of, re of, of revival or when and where God um, revitalizes his people. He gives them as if you read through the prayer guide, one of the definitions of, of the result is, is that God gives his people a missionary spirit that they want to go and tell other people about what God had done for them about who Jesus is. They, and, it's, and it's not just that they, they want to, it's almost this compelling, it's kind of like get up out of your seat and go tell what the Lord has done. Tell of his transforming grace in your life. And, and that's what happened. Many new believers also called their parents and friends eager to share what the Lord was doing. And you know that, that that's what Paul's assignment was from the beginning? To tell of him, of Jesus. That was his assignment from the beginning. Be a witness to all people about what you've seen and heard and what I've done for you. And you know that that, that is not just something that Paul gave himself to at the beginning of his walk with Christ. But he's found doing it at the end, near the end of his life as well. He's like the... The trees in Psalm chapter 1, or Psalm 1 or 2, where it says that they are green in every season, fruitful always, because they are planted by the water. Paul, Paul shares his testimony. He, he must, he tells of Jesus and testifies to the grace of the Lord Jesus. First we saw before James and the leaders of the Jerusalem church, and they were a more receptive crowd, but then he also does it before a hostile crowd who has just tried to kill him. Suzanne read the context of, of what leads up to our passage today and how he was arrested there in Jerusalem and brought to the barracks. And before he's taken in, he requests to speak to the crowd who had just tried to kill him. <laughs> and this is that account. Acts 21, verses 37 through part of chapter 22. 
As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied, aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? Paul answered, no, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to this people. Having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. And when they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen to now, now to my defense. And when they heard him speak in, his, in their own language, they became even more quiet. Then Paul said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia who was brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way and, and even to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. Oh, and as the high priest and all the council can testify, I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. But about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around me and I fell down to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not hear or understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told of all that I've signed you to, assigned you to, to you to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know the will, to know his will, and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you've seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away by calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. He's speaking of another vision he had. And saw the Lord speaking, quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied. These men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. But the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. With that, the crowd listened to Paul, but until, until he said this, then they raised their voices and shouted as they did before, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. The word of the Lord. So the fear of the Ephesian elders and those believers in the other towns that Paul had visited before in Tyre and Caesarea, all their fears are now realized. They didn't want Paul to go to Jerusalem because they had heard and discerned that, that from the Holy Spirit that Paul was going to be arrested just as he is now. And even though it's based on a false accusation, it still happens. And this is why they didn't want him to go. Paul, why did you? Why would you want to go if you're going to face that? And so Paul is put in chains and he's brought to the barracks. But it also gives him the opportunity to do what he knows he is sent to do and what he must do. And that is to tell even these people who have just tried to kill him about Jesus. About Jesus. And that's what he knew he had to do in Ephesians uh, excuse me, to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 22 through 24, he says to them, he explains that, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What is that task? The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. This is what he must do. 
And this is what he's doing now to these people who are so hostile towards him. So he's requesting and gets this permission to share and he addresses them, uh, this hushed crowd now and gives them his defense. But do you notice what his defense is? It's not uh, explaining why he was at the temple that day when he was arrested and that he didn't bring that Gentile into the temple as they had supposed. He doesn't try to defend his innocence. His defense is to tell of his commission and encounter with the living Christ. He tells them about Jesus. He begins his defense by relating his Jewish heritage including the fact that he was a student of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a really high expect, uh, respected teacher. He, he, uh, he, he was a teacher of the law and everybody held him of high esteem. And Paul also identifies with their zeal that they display by trying to kill him. In, in essence, Paul is, like, is, is, is saying to them, look, I, I know what you're feeling and going through. I know why your, your faces are so red and about to burst with anger because I was where you are. I have, I have been just as zealous for God as you are right now. I, I was there. He's trying to get them to identify with him as he tells his account, tells his story. In fact, the NLT puts it, I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you are today. And so he goes through it. He goes through what he did. He persecuted the church. That is, he went after men and women who were believers and threw them in prison, had them arrested. He even approved of Stephen's killing. He stood there and said, yes, that's okay. Even though he, he saw the innocence of Stephen's face when he looked up to heaven. He saw all that and he said, that's okay. That's what I want. He said, I was there doing the very same thing that you just did to me, basically. He said, I, I, I've been in your shoes. I've done all that. He, he, he confesses that he tried to do that to the church. He persecuted the church. And he says the religious leaders could verify that if they wanted to. The high priest and the council, they know about all this because they gave him letters to go to Damascus and and so he could go get believers there. He wasn't he wasn't content, he tells them, to just go after the believers in Jerusalem. He went to many foreign cities, including Damascus. And Damascus is way far north in Syria. Here's Jerusalem, here's Damascus. I mean, he's he's really enraged going after these believers. You know, zeal. Zeal can be misplaced, even for religious reasons, even in the name of God. And Paul admits that he was wrong in that zeal. He isn't, he isn't the Egyptian who started the revolt in the wilderness, but he did terrorize the church. Paul, or Saul as he had been known by, it would seem is a hopeless case. How could somebody like that, so hostile to Jesus, so enraged at believers that he would go that far away to track them down? How could somebody like that ever realize the error of his ways, ever come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? How could somebody like that, how could there be any hope for him? If you use the material from the 24 hours of prayer, the guide on the miracle board, you'll recall the account of this hopeless case, in quotation marks. In his book, Glory in the Glen, a historical, uh, a history of the evangelical revival in Scotland, Tom Lenny shares the account of one woman who in many respects was that town's hopeless case, the town of Camelot. She was, she was so far gone. In, in anybody's estimation. How could she ever come to know the Lord? I mean, she is just way out there, kind of like Saul was. Not in the same ways, but away from the Lord. In Camelot, Scotland, one of the open-air meetings was held in, a, in that place where she was, and 
she was like a lot of the other people in that town. Nobody seemed to have any interest on what was going on. The evangelist John Livingston Stone said that week after week, we sang the songs and the preaching, but very few gathered. And it was like all the songs and preaching was bouncing off the walls of the building back to us. Nobody was interested, but he didn't give up. He says, no, I, I believe God wants me here. And he continued to pray for God to work. And, and even though nobody seemed to look or to listen, nobody seemed to care, he, he went on with the meetings. And unbeknownst to him, that woman was listening in her grocery store, hiding behind the curtain so she couldn't be seen. But she was listening. She had almost destroyed her life. She, she had developed a taste for the alcohol, some of the alcohol she sold and was fast drinking herself to bankruptcy. But she was listening. Even though everybody considered her a hopeless case, or many would, she was listening and it was to her, the word of God came with saving power. She later testified that she gradually became interested until the point that she would anticipate and she just had this, this burden on her heart waiting and waiting for that time to come and then would just sit there eagerly to listen to the songs and the message and waiting for it to begin. And then finally, a word of deliverance came and she was set free from her bondage and openly confessed Christ as one who was so hopeless. This raises an assertion, one of three, that, that uh, Paul's testimony makes about Jesus. And the first one is, there are no hopeless cases to the Lord. Not that woman in Camel on Scotland. Not anyone that we're praying for. Not you, not me, not Paul, not anyone even in that hostile crowd who just tried to kill him. That's why he shares this good news. Because Paul believes it, because he's experienced it. There are no hopeless cases to the Lord. Think about those people you've been praying for for years and years and years. And it seems like your prayers for them have been bouncing off the wall back to you. Guess what? God's at work. Guess what? They're listening. Christ is drawing them to himself. Paul testifies to what happened to him. He says, the risen Christ himself came to meet me on the road to Damascus. Right as he entered the city, he was about to enter the city to, to start to arrest people and believers. And Christ and showed up on the road. He says, about noon, a bright light flashes from heaven and knocks him to the ground. In other words, he's humbled. Uh, one of the meanings uh, of what happens here is also that he's overcome by, by fear and astonishment of what's happened. Through this encounter of the risen Christ, Saul realizes that he is fully known in a way that he did not know before. Because this person who has just revealed himself to him calls him by name, Saul. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he doesn't know who this is, but he knows that, that he's known by Jesus. And he, and he, and it's revealed to him that he's not just been persecuting believers, but that he's been persecuting Jesus himself. In other words, his teacher had been right, Gamalo. Gamala had told the, the council of the religious leaders to stop messing with Peter and John and to leave them alone. And that if it was, uh, if it was a human plan and a human movement, that it would fail. But that if it was of God, you would be found fighting against God. And that's what Paul realizes now he had been doing this whole time. It wasn't just the believers he was after. Jesus reveals to him that it is he himself that Paul had been harassing and troubling and persecuting and hurting. Let's see, It was Jesus. It was Jesus. And amazingly... You see, Jesus comes to the very one who was hurting him so much to reveal his love for him. 
That's why we sing songs like Amazing Grace. You see. Because that is an amazing. That's not what you do to enemies. You tell them off. You wish the worst for them. But that's not what Paul is doing before this hostile crowd. Because that's not what Jesus did to him. <clears throat> Make no mistake, the Lord's revelation to Paul is also mercy on all the believers there in Damascus. He saved them from what Paul was intending to do to them. But he, he's, he's, he's told that it's really Jesus he's been persecuting. Jesus says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And this, this you see, also announces to the crowd that it's not just to Paul. They've been doing this too, but they've also been doing this to Jesus. They just try to kill Paul. That's the way they've been treating Jesus. This is the second assertion made by Paul's testimony that Jesus intensely identifies with his church. He died for the church, for all of us, but for his church. And Ephesians 5 talks about how Jesus nourishes and tenderly cares for the church because we're members of his body. I was reminded of similar language of the people of God in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. Truly the one who touches you touches the very apple of my eye, God says. One of the commentators says this term of endearment suggests that Judah is as close to God as, figuratively speaking, the pupil of God's eye, one of the most sensitive parts of the body. And Jesus reveals to Paul, in the same way you're treating my body, you are treating me. In the same way you're persecuting these believers, you're treating me. And by the way, that's how the body of Christ itself is set up too, right? The body of Christ, when one member suffers, all suffer with it. And when one member rejoices, all members rejoice with it. Because that's how the body of Christ is designed. With Christ as our head. And you know, when Paul hears this, he seems to know that this is going to change the entire trajectory of his life. He had been going one way. He had been trying to destroy Christ in his church. But now he seems to understand that this is going to be a complete turn, turnaround and reversal of the entire trajectory of his life. And he will have to go the other direction. Because he asked, what do you want me to do, Lord? <laughs> <laughs> One thing's for certain, he, he is not, even if he wanted to, he is not going into Damascus to track down believers because he can't see. He's been blinded. So even if he wanted to do that, which he doesn't at this point, but even if he wanted to, he has been humbled to the fact that people have to lead him by hand into the city because he can't see his own way. But this question asserts that that isn't what he wants anymore anymore. This question tells Jesus that he surrenders to what he would want for him. This question, what do you want me to do, Lord, is a, is a, is a question of, of submitting to the Lord. That he wants to do what the Lord wants now. Not what Paul wanted to do. Not what, Paul, not what, what he wanted to do to terrorize the church. He doesn't want to do that anymore. What is it that you want me to do, Lord? And the Lord informs him that he'll be told for what he's been appointed to. And it's Ananias who comes to tell him that he is a witness to all people. He'll be a witness to all people. And, and from then until now, that's what he's doing, to tell of him. In other words, he's not, his sight is not just physically restored. He's now able to see clearly the grace he's been shown. And he must tell of him as a result. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. This is Paul's recognition of that. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, and he has considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the truth, the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, 
so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And Paul is called to go and be a witness, called to take this message even to the Gentiles. In that second vision, the Lord tells him that he's sending him to the Gentiles. And that's when the crown loses it. Notice in verse 24 there, or 22, they lose it when they hear that word, the mention of Gentiles. Loyal to be comments, Paul touched the raw nerve of their predetermined prejudice with that word Gentile. So even though the church had validated and verified that God was working in this way, that he was uh, uh, drawing the, the Gentiles to himself as well, the, many of the other Jews who were not believers weren't receptive to this. Nevertheless, Paul says, the same Lord who sought after me on the road to Damascus is the same Lord who commissioned me to go and tell the Gentiles that the Lord is seeking them too. Same Lord. This raises the third and final assertion that Paul's testimony raises. Jesus is a seeking Savior. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That was our Sunday school lesson this morning in the teen Sunday school class, Luke 19, 10. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's what he's done for Paul. Dr. Scott Rainey, the global director of Sunday School and Discipleship Ministries for the Church of the Nazarene, shares this truth in the account of his father's salvation as well. He said, my father didn't have the privilege or the benefit of growing up in the church or, 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 or going to church or growing up in a Christian home. He, would, he was a young man, though, and he, and he remembered that he saw a a billboard. He would often see a billboard with a scripture verse on it. The only scripture verse he knew, because he had no Christian upbringing or background, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And he always wondered about what that verse meant and it stuck in his mind because he saw it often. What does that verse mean? It was the only one he knew. It wasn't John 3, 16. It was Matthew 6, 33. In the spring of 1972, Scott says, my dad did enter the church. It happened to be a church of the Nazarene for the first time at the invitation of a neighbor whose name was Mike Crouch. He was actually just doing a seminary assignment for an evangelism class assigned by Dr. Chick Shaver. That's the reason he invited him. But the Lord even used something like that. He said, my father was lost broken and living in sin. And there was an evangelist that, that morning by the name of Paul Martin. But, my, but my, uh, my dad says that he felt like the evangelist had been walking with him his whole life and knew everything he did because it was like everything he was saying was directed at me. And do you know the scripture that he preached on that morning? Matthew 6, 33. The only scripture his dad knew and Scott said, it was just so evident that Jesus was seeking out my dad. And he was. Matthew 6, 33. And at the end of the service, my father met Jesus at the altar of the church. His sins were forgiven. He was a healed man. He had met Jesus. His shame and disgrace was transformed by the mercy and grace of God. And he can testify himself. He says, I had a new dad. Because why? Because of the grace of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus, the Savior, sought out his dad. That's what grace is. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's what happened with Scott's dad. The Savior came to him, searching for him, and used something that he remembered from way back in childhood that stuck with him. The only verse he knew, and that in his providence was there that day being preached. Seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus is a seeking Savior. Jesus, you see, not only sought Scott Rainey's dad, but seeks Paul on the road to Damascus. Jesus, that's mind-boggling, even used a homework assignment for his kingdom and for his glory. 
Jesus, then we can be sure, is already at work in the lives of those that we pray for this weekend and have been praying for. Uh, that, that we can be sure that he's going to take the initiative and, and that he's calling them to respond to his gracious invitation. We can be sure that Jesus has the authority to forgive sins and can, and can change lives. Not only was Scott Rainey's death changed, but think about Saul or Paul, who he became. Talk about a complete change. Like I said, a complete change in the trajectory of his life from going this way to going this way. It's called repentance. Turning from this and turning to God. That's what God can do in a person's life. Paul's a changed man. He seemed like a hopeless case, but the Savior sought him out. And you know what? Paul didn't waste any time. Ananias encouraged him and said, what are you waiting for? Paul didn't wait. He immediately went into the synagogues in Damascus and began preaching and teaching that Jesus was the Messiah. <laughs> the one who had just, just been persecuting, now he's proclaiming and preaching. And not only in Damascus, but also in Jerusalem and all throughout the missionary journeys. And now back in Jerusalem all these years later, Paul is still, still telling of the grace of the Lord Jesus. If you musicians would come. Um, in the youth group, uh, we used to take uh, take the kids down to Shelter KC, or it used to be Kansas City Rescue Mission. And uh, one of the people there that we always worked with was Michael, who was the cook. And Michael, he was a very outgoing person, very charismatic personality, and he was always engaging people in conversation. And one of the questions he would often ask people is, what's your story? about his glory. That's what Paul's just, just, just shared in this account about the grace of the Lord Jesus in his life. Not just then at that initial encounter, but also all this, all this, all that, all that God had appointed for him, all that God had purposed for him, all that he walked in obedience to, even now as he's before this hostile crowd, telling them of Jesus. You know, that's, that's something that Jesus is still doing. Jesus can still change a person's life. Jesus still has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus can still change the trajectory of your life from going your own way, which is a path of destruction, which is a path uh, with his, which is a path to 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 uh, not only destruction but away from the Lord in every way, to a path walking with Him, knowing the purpose for which He has has uh, created you. So we're gonna sing here a song of response in a moment, and the invitation is twofold. First. For those of us who do know the Lord, this, this relates to our vision statement to be a visible sign of Christ's presence and love uh, to the people of the community and to the world. Would we allow God to give us that burden to see how much people do need God, even if they're as far off and as hopeless as we can think in our own, own way of thinking, that they need God the most right now? And how this world needs God, how this world needs the hope found only in him right now, and how the world needs the body of Christ to be present in this world and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to tell of him. So won't you, won't you tell of him? If you know Jesus, may the Lord give you a missionary spirit. I wonder who, who could you tell? And what might, what, what might you share with them from your own story about his glory with them this week if you had opportunity? And then the second invitation. Perhaps some here this morning have sensed that Jesus is seeking them because he is. And you would want to say yes to his invitation. And you would want to say yes to, to what he has for you. And you would want to say yes to whatever it is that he has for you because you just know and you can, you can sense that he's good. And that only he can save you. 
as we sing. And I invite you to stand to sing. As we sing, that's the invitation. If you would want to come um, to the altars to respond to either of those, that's that the altars are always open. But especially if you if you don't know him this morning, the grace of the Lord Jesus is being extended to you by Jesus himself. Not, not me, but by Jesus himself. And you can encounter the same living Lord that Paul did on the road to Damascus. It, might, it won't be as dramatic as he experienced on that road, but it will be no less real. He wants you to come to him. And that is, that is, a, that is a gracious invitation to you this morning. Let's sing this hymn together in response. <laughs>